Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Marat Birimjan, and I will be moderator of our forum today. So being a KBTU graduate myself and an oil and gas industry professional, like all of us, there is something that we put very, very close to our hearts and minds, which is health and safety. So please allow us to start our forum today with an HSC briefing by our dear hosts, KBTU. Dear participants of the Youth uh, Forum, good day everyone. So the organization, committee and administration of KBT warn that in case of emergency situations and dangerous events during you, your stay in this building, for emergency evacuation you need to proceed without causing panic to the emergency exit located on the left side of the balcony of the first floor of the Independence Hall. Also, to the exit from the side of Tulibi Street or to the main exits through the entrance groups located at the back of the Independence Hall, down the stairs through the entrance groups from the side of Kazbek B Street that is shown in the scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. <clears throat> Your Excellency, President of the World Petroleum Council, distinguished guests, honorable speakers, ladies and gentlemen, the World Petroleum Council Youth Forum is a platform for youth professionals, for, for young professionals and industry researchers to share experience and cutting edge achievements in the oil and gas industry. And after very successful events in Beijing, in Paris, New Delhi, Calgary, Rio de Janeiro, St. Petersburg, and now Almaty is very proud to host the seventh Youth Forum of the World Petroleum Council. <clears throat> the theme of the Almaty Forum is Energy Transition, Dialogue of Generations. The role of the new generation in the consumption of a low-carbon, safe and secure energy future. And we have an absolutely amazing panel of keynote speakers with us today, led by His Excellency Mr. Pedro Miras Salamanca, the YPC president. We also... Yeah. We also have with us today Mr. Murat Zhuribekov, who is the first Vice Minister of Energy of Kazakhstan. It's a great honor for us also to have Mr. Shambolat Sarsenov with us today, the Vice Chair of YPC Kazakhstan National Committee. And we also have uh, Mr. Joseph McMonigal, the Secretary General of the International Energy Forum with us today. And also, of course, the, the, main, the main speaker, the representative of the youth at the Youth Forum, Mrs. Lisana Kurbanshoeva, the Chair of YPC Young Professionals Committee. And I'm very happy to say that we've got over 700 delegates from 29 countries participating in the forum today. And it is my great honor and pleasure and privilege to say that we will have a welcome address by His Excellency President Kasim Jomart Kemelul Tokayev to all participants of our forum today. 
This will be read to us by Mr. Murat Jurebekov, first Vice Minister of Energy of Kazakhstan. After which, Mr. Jurebekov will also give us his keynote speech on behalf of the Ministry of Energy of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Mr. Jurebekov, the floor is yours. Good day, dear participants of today's meeting. Let me first of all read out the welcome remarks on behalf of the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jamar Tokayev. Distinguished participants of the 7th Youth Forum World Petroleum Council, I congratulate, congratulate you with the opening. This is a global dialogue platform that attracts young professionals from different countries to find new ways to accelerate to accelerate uh, development the oil and gas sector plays a key role in the social and economic development of Kazakhstan over the years of independence more than 200 billion dollars of foreign direct investment has been attracted to this field they would attach particular importance to the development of the gas and petrochemical industries. In October of past year, the largest polar propylene manufacturing facility in Central Asia, with a production capacity of 500,000 tons per year, was started. As a responsible country in the global energy market, we're deeply aware of the importance of climate issues and are consistently pursuing a decarbonization policy. Kazakhstan is the first country in the CIS to ratify the Paris Agreement. We set ourselves the ambitious goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2060. For its realization, a special long-term strategy is taken. I am confident that young specialists and scientists will make a significant contribution to the development of the energy sector of new country. I wish you all further success and prosperity. President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jamart Kimelolo Tokayev. The Youth Forum, on behalf of the Ministry of Energy of the Republic of Kazakhstan, I welcome you on the opening of the 7th WPC Youth Forum. I express my deep gratitude to WPC Mr. Salamanca for your trust and support in holding today's event in Kazakhstan, particularly in Almaty. The World Petroleum Council, founded in London in 1933 for almost 90 years, has been bringing together the world's best experts to discuss key issues in the oil and gas industry. Topic of today's forum is energy transition, dialogue of generations. Today, the world community is actively discussing the need to undertake urgent measures to ensure energy transition, decarbonization, and low carbon development. We truly believe that the new generation of highly qualified specialists will be able to find new approaches in solving difficult problems of today's world. It is important, especially today, to pay great, great attention to supporting young professionals which is our future leaders. As you, as you well know, the oil and gas sector plays a strategic role for our country. We are one of the world's leaders in terms of oil reserves and production. Today, Kazakhstan is among the 15 leading countries in the world, possessing 3% of the world's oil reserves. For many years, almost all world oil corporations from United States, Europe, China, Russia, and other countries have been operating in Kazakhstan, recognizing the high potential and attractiveness of the investment climate in our region. Today, the world community is at the stage of searching for universal solutions for all parties to decarbonize the oil and gas industry. We understand that the consistent and gradual approach to decarbonization of the oil and gas industry depends on the large number of factors including technological, geoeconomic, regulatory, and, others, and other factors. 
Currently, we are developing the strategy for, the, for reaching carbon neutrality in Kazakhstan until 2060. This is the first long-term document that is aimed at shaping a vision of the reduction of greenhouse and gas emissions in Kazakhstan. We pay great interest in developing cooperation in the field of renewable energy sources, uh, conversion of oil of coal-fired stations to gas, development of gas fields and gas processing, petrochem and hydrogen energy. These are the main areas that we will actively develop in the short term. Since 2018, the Republic of Kazakhstan has been using an open mechanism for international auctions based on equality, fair competition and openness. For the period from 2018 to 2021, auctions were held in electronic format for renewable energy projects with a total capacity of 1.7 thousand megawatts. Almost uh, 200 companies from 12 countries, which is uh, China, Turkey, Germany, France, Bulgaria, Italy, UAE, Netherlands, Malaysia, Spain, Russia, took part in the auction. <coughs> Another promising area in, uh, is the development of hydrogen energy. We are currently conducting research in three areas. The first one, the hydrogen produ production, the transportation and storage of hydrogen and converting hydrogen into electricity. We believe that energy transition should be based on the principle of social equal transition and include all issues including social, gender, employment and education, future, develop future development of new professions and skills including for people with disabilities. At the same time, it is important not only to provide jobs, but also to develop access to education and develop social protection measures. Measures are being taken in the Republic of Kazakhstan to comprehensively support young people and create conditions for their professional development. We pay great attention to strengthening the intellectual potential of our country, especially to supporting technical educational institutions and the process of transforming multidisciplinary institutions into research universities. I believe that the transfer of knowledge of a more experienced generation along with the implementation of new innovation, innovative solutions has the potential to provide the necessary synergy effect for the future development of the world's energy sector. I'm confident that the seventh World Petroleum Council US Forum will become an effective platform for discussing possible ways to achieve an energy transition and will create an opportunity for important dialogue between the generations. In conclusion, I would like to wish all the participants of the forum successful work, productive meetings, and a good time spent in the beautiful city of Almaty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. First Vice Minister, dear ladies and gentlemen, this was a very insightful and elaborate presentation of the work that the government is doing to develop our industry. And Mr. Murad Jurebekov highlighted all the relevant aspects in what we are doing in terms of developing upstream, midstream, downstream, all the, the whole value chain of the oil and gas, but also some new products like hydrogen, and also very, very importantly, what we're doing in terms of energy transition and what we're doing in terms of providing training, vocational training and education for students for use for future oil and gas professionals. So thank you very much, um, Vice Minister, for this and all your hard work in terms of developing all these relevant sectors. So dear ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to give the floor to uh, an oil and gas industry professional of truly world-class caliber with more than 30 years of experience in international oil and gas organizations like the International Energy Agency, like the World Petroleum Council, and like Repsol. So Mr. Pedro Mira Salamanca, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Excellencies, uh, delegates, and dear guests. The energy situation has changed 
very rapidly during the recent times last year. Until 2020, it seems that security of supply and access to affordable energy was warranted. And all efforts should be focused on environmental challenge. And this is where the entire energy community had embarked for this quest on the quest of the, for a just energy transition. However, in the last two years, the COVID pandemic and the conflict in, in, in Europe has remained us that none of the three pillars of energy supply should be taken for granted. Clean and sustainable energy with security of supply and at affordable prices is still the question to be solved. And we must do this in environments in which, moreover, the perception of part of the society has of our industry and how we do the things is not the best, and which the end of hydrocarbon is predicted by near. In this regard, let me say that the world will continue to need our participation for a long time to come. The world's population is approaching 8 million people, which means that energy demand will continue to grow. And in this scenario, hydrocarbons will continue to play a major role. Indeed, in the latest data for the International Energy Agency forecast, oil demand of 99.5 million barrels per year by the end of 2022, equivalent to the 31% of the world primary energy demand, which will be around 107 million barrels per day. And the agency future projections are showing exactly the same. And with regard to natural gas, the picture is quite similar. We share in the total energy matrix close to 25% of the consumption of around 4,086 4, BCMs by 2020, higher to the pre-pandemic figure that is close to 4,000. On the other hand, the consumption situation is very unbalanced with geographical areas of high energy use, computers, high condition, massive use of transport, and many other things, and compared to others with very limited or non-existent access, it is estimated that around one million of the planet's inhabitants still do not have access to electricity. Providing this vector of developing this to the entire population is a very high responsibility and the participation of traditional energies in a responsible manner seems essential. And this, for this reason, it does not seem obvious to think that the disruptive substitution of the hydrocarbons consumption will take place in the near future. However, the transition towards a decarbonized world, world that protects our planet from the effects of the greenhouse gases is a goal assumed by the society as a whole, including the oil and gas sector that today is here. And to this end, companies have committed themselves and are reorient or entitled their strategies based on process, products, and service that contributes to this achievement. But all of this must be done without forgetting that the three pillars that support energy system are essential and must be well balanced. In short, we are looking for new solutions for the same old challenges. And let me tell you that it, would not, it will not be a single and simple solution. It will be for sure a group of different technology-based solutions that will solve the equation. This is the challenge of our industry must face in the coming years. And this is where the World Petroleum Council has an essential role to play. This is because our activities have always been based on an open and inclusive dialogue that gathers as many points of views as possible without prejudging or having preconceived positions. In this sense, the new approach of the WPC embodying the, its strategic plan consolidates this vocation. Thus, after a long reflection initiated in the cycle of the 23rd Congress in Houston, it will be here in Almaty that the plan will be approved. The seven strategic lines that comprise it are based on the WPC vocation 
to be the main arena for discussion of the challenges that the energy sector requires, to be recognized as a premium global forum facilitating an open dialogue around oil, gas, and energy and their products is the mission of the WPC has adopted for the future. Therefore, the World Petroleum Council family, which will be 90 years old next year, Almaty will be a name forever linked to the evolution of this institution. But we are here celebrating under the theme of energy transition, energy dialogue of generation, the seventh youth forum, which I have the honor to, to participate today together with other distinguished personalities. I would like, like to thank the Kazakhstan authorities, Kazakhstan National Committee, the city of Almaty, and the WPC Secretariat and the Youth Committee for all their work and efforts to make this event a reality. Given the program and speakers and sessions, I can already anticipate that it will be a huge success. But this is also an example of the vocation of this institution. As I said at the beginning, the purpose of the WPC is to be the greatest facilitator of debate to address the energy solutions that our society is demanding. And the motto of the forum defines this as a dialogue between generations for energy transition. The experience of those of us who have been in this sector for some years and the innovation creativity and drive to the new generation will lead us to find the way to achieve this energy transition for a lot. I sincerely believe that during these days I will hear a variety of opinions that will address the complex issues I mentioned at the beginning in a frank and open way without a prior, priority fixed positions and considering that the solution of energy equation requires all our good work. Let me say a few words to the young people that are the, the, the protagonists of this. It's in this framework that with the participation of all of you young people of the WPC, it's fundamental. It is a matter of governing your vision, your perspective, your concerns, and your proposal for solutions. We need your reflection in order to continue searching for the transition toward a more sustainable energy model that does not take for granted the rest of the variable that sustain a healthy energy system. But not only that, we also demand an active role from you in some aspects. We need your demand for the continuous improvement of our quality standards in terms of social responsibility and also the dissemination of the benefits of our sector, nowadays questioned in many forums. You have an obligation to demand continuous improvement in the application of the best practice in environmental, corporate social responsibility and governance matters in order to ensure that our industry is recognized as being the forefront in these areas. This is because your status naturally makes you more permeable to new social demands and quicker to assimilate them. But you also have the obligation and the historic opportunity to apply all this creativity to come with your fresh eyes to the process and our products in our sector in order to meet the challenges of meeting the world's demand and at the same time addressing a just energy transition. But this is not the end. You also have an important role to play in spreading the word that what we do well in the, in the industry. And this is in this role that you, young people, have a more active and I would say protagonist profile. Our industry must improve communication with society. We have a leading role that we assume in a, respons in a responsible way in the key aspects such as supply of energy society, but, no, but we are not always seen as such. We need to communicate better, and for this today, more traditional systems are not enough. More direct and personalized sites, communication is needed. Social network make it possible. And, the East, and it is where you have the greatest impact by being active in those channels, providing truthfulness in, uh, to an informed debates, arguing with a fair than disseminate the qualities of this sector. In short, you must play a leading role in the transformation of the industry and explain to society how proud you are to work in this sector that is essential for the human development. Responsible in its approach and a generator of wealth 
and well-being for the society as a whole. I encourage you to do so actively, and not only in the Almaty Forum that begins today, but also in your day-to-day -day conversations and social networks. Well, we have all the elements to make this seventh forum be remembered with us with its now name as the Almaty Forum. A complex global energy situation that shows that nothing is granted and requires an open and constitutive dialogue. A new impetus for the activities of the World Petroleum Council embodied in its new strategic plan on which this forum is a clear example. The program, the organization, the speakers, and the support of this wonderful country, this great city, and its authority. But we also have the most important thing, the participation and commitment on, of all of you, young people of the WPC, the quarry that uh, will lead us to the better future. Be participative and contribute with your ideas. It will be great to, to continue advances advancing in the design on a fair, balanced, sustainable energy landscape. I think that the success here of the seventh forum is certainly guaranteed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Salamanca, for such an insightful presentation of the whole macro overview that our industry is facing today. I've uh, written down some, some notes from your presentation and thank you very much for sharing your industry wisdom and experience and explaining some of the very complex and complicated things in a very simple and clear manner, especially to our young audience, the Youth Forum participants. So you mentioned the three pillars of energy system. You mentioned the challenges and the headwinds that the industry is facing, but also the opportunity that we can tap on. Also, you spoke about energy transition and energy solution. And we all know that the WPC is about vision, perspectives, concerns, and solutions for the oil and gas industry. So thank you very much for everything that you did for our uh, participants today with regards to sharing your experience and your vision and your insights. Thank you. Um, so, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, as you know, Kazakhstan National Committee of the World Petroleum Council is the organizer of the seventh Youth Forum of YPC, and Kazakhstan National Company has been a very active participant of WPC since 2008. And I would like to give uh, the floor to the Vice Chair of Kazakhstan National Committee of the World Petroleum Council, Mr. Jambolat Jakivich Sarsianov. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marat, Your Excellencies, uh, dear forum participants, dear friends, colleagues. Holding such a, an important uh, uh, and honorable event is a great development for the region. Since the first youth forum held in uh, Beijing, thousands of young professionals from over the world have had the unique opportunity to be heard by global industry leaders. I'm confident that the re uh, resolution of the Almaty Forum will make a significant contribution to the development of the youth movement. The consequences of the pandemic, the instability of the regional energy markets have uh, once again shown the importance of the stable, confident operation of the oil and gas industry. The supply of uh, affordable energy to consumers with uh, minimal environmental impact in the modern world to ensure the uh, energy and environmental uh, security of the planet. We need balanced, uh, responsible actions of the all market participants, both producers and consumers, uh, will long-term respective for the sustainable development of all countries to ensure the better future for all the nations of the earth. The topic of discussions of the Almaty Forum is extremely relevant to the, for us and future generations. The, cur the current stage 
of the development of the industry indicates the needs to the industry, the search, the opportunities for the wider introduction of the advanced technologies with the involvement of the clean and safe energy sources in the energy mix. At the same time, technological transformation affects the entire energy chain for the production and transportation to processing and the consumption of the energy resources. I would also like to mention science and the role of scientific and technological progress. A new generation of managers and young scientists faces uh, serious challenges to adapt the, and improve the existing areas of low carbon energy to the technological capabilities of the, our time. I hope that the participants of the 7th WPC Youth Forum will be able to open the expert community to the expert community, the new faces of integrated solutions to shape the countless of the global energy sectors in the, of the 21st century. Uh, dear colleagues, sharpening the global agenda for the implementations of the energy transition and, and separately uh, linked with the uh, responsible government approach to support the intellectual potential of the young talents. It's great, great find that uh, all conditions have been created in the Republic of Kazakhstan since independence, so that highly qualified human capital is formed in the labor market, in the sector of the economy, technologies, in the industry, uh, uh, supplemented by the scientific and applied research. And the level of the management is raised in the accordance with the new market trends and needs. The President of Republic of Kazakhstan systematically implements a st strategy to support Kazakhstan use and increase investment in the human capital development. The Kazakhstan National Committee of the World Petroleum Council fully support the state policy to create favorable conditions for the qualitative growth of the leaders of the new Kazakhstan, capable to making impressive technological and social breakthrough with, uh, which will undoubtedly succeed. Uh, dear forum participants, the next year we, the World Petroleum Council celebrates its 90th anniversary and uh, we are pleased that the Almaty Forum will become a starting point for updating and improving the activities of the organization. A specific uh, milestone of the current youth forum is the adopting a new WPC strategic development plan. I'm confident that the reliable history of the World Petroleum Council, coupled with blood, bold uh, ideas of the young professionals, will make it possible to intensify our joint activities and set the necessary uh, impetus for the successful implementation of the development plan of the World Petroleum Council. Dear colleagues, Kazakhstan is one of the experienced and active members of the World Petroleum Council. We have tried to create the best conditions for your comfortable stay in our country and uh, fruitful work uh, on the sidelines of the Youth Forum. Welcome to the Southern Capital of Kazakhstan. I wish all participants to be to of the of the all the participants of the event uh, productive work and uh, important achievements. From my side, especially, I would like to uh, dedicate special thanks and the uh, words of the. Uh, Thanks to the, our member, member uh, companies of the National Committee. The support of the companies was so great and we was able to, uh, in a short period, to uh, establish the team and organize the big uh, and important event for uh, our uh, youth, young generation in the frame of this university. It's the historical place, is the historical uh, events was happened in this uh, auditorium and I hope that the young generation has, uh, has blessed to have and achieved 
the big and uh, great uh, achievements in the new practical world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarsianov, and all the team at the Kazakhstan National Committee of the YPC for all the hard work you're doing with regards to putting this all together. And I particularly liked in your speech the, uh, the highlights and the importance of the technological transition. So not only energy transition, but technological transition for energy transition and some other enablers that would help us to transition to a cleaner energy future. You also had very, very good points and, uh, with regards to science and the issues that young scientists are facing when they're entering the industry. And also, of course, the very important aspects of human capital development in the oil and gas industry with very, very clear focus on use and young professionals development. Thank you very much for this. Dear ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to give the floor to our next keynote speaker, Mr. Joseph McMonigle, Secretary General of the Ener International Energy Forum. So Mr. McMonigle has more than 20 years of experience in government and energy sectors. He was president and founder of the Abraham Group, which is one of the leading international energy advisors in our industry, and also has spent many, many years of hard work at the Ministry of Energy of the United States. Mr. Joseph McMoneagle, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, Your Excellency, First Vice Minister, uh, WPC President uh, Pedro Mira Salamanca, and members of the uh, organizing committee, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to address this youth forum on energy transition in the context of a dialogue between uh, generations. I think it's very important that we gather today in Kazakhstan, one of the leaders for global energy security with the world going through the energy crisis we're in today while we continue to pursue the energy transition. So in my remarks today, I'll start with an overview, I think, of the current energy market dynamics and then focus on the future, on three priorities for the future for policymakers as we enter a critical phase for recovery, stability, and security. First. A little background on the IEF, many of you may not be familiar with the International Energy Forum. We're 30 years old uh, this year. Uh, we uh, were formed uh, because uh, previous to the IEF, you had the consuming countries of the IEA and the producing countries of OPEC, but they didn't really talk to each other or communicate. So it was decided that there should be a formal organization of both producers and consumers. Uh, of course, 30 years later, we have more uh, countries as members than, than those two groups combined. But the Secretary uh, General of OPEC and the Executive Director of the IEA are on my executive board. Uh, so while we're the consuming and producing countries organization, I also find that we are increasingly the developed and developing world uh, organization as well. We have over 30 countries from Africa who are members and very much care about all the developing uh, issues as it relates to the transition and energy security. And finally, we also host something called JODI, which is the Joint Organizations Data Initiative. It stores uh, all the production and consumption data for all the countries. Uh, we provide it for free. Some, as you may be aware, some of the other uh, organizations don't give it for free. They actually charge you for to, to get the information, but we make the information available for free. <clears throat> Prior to me becoming uh, Secretary General, all we did was put it on the website for everyone to see it, but now we're actually taking some of the data that we get from Jody and doing some analysis with it. So if, as you see reports that, that we do, we're increasingly relying on Jody data and every month we produce uh, an analysis of the, of the latest data. 
So let me talk a little bit about today's market. I mean, of course, as, as everyone knows, we've moved from one unprecedented event to another over the past two years. As markets were rebalancing after the shock of the pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has triggered a drastic realignment in producer-consumer relations. And of course, now there are widespread expectations of a global recession because of uh, the war, because of the pandemic, because of uh, inflation and supply chain issues. Oil prices have subsided in recent weeks on financial markets pricing in really bad economic news and, and potentially a decline in demand as a result. But coal and gas prices remain high, and physical oil markets remain tight. I like to say that we have a tale of two markets. We have the financial uh, oil markets, which the, is trading really paper and pricing in bad economic news in the future. And then we have the physical markets, people who are trading supplies for today, and that market is quite tight. Analysts who once characterized the market as lower for longer are now talking of higher and more volatile markets. Indeed, the global energy complex is extremely stressed. While oil prices uh, declined recently, I really regard this as a false calm in oil markets. And that's because demand after the pandemic has returned to pre-pandemic levels, but supply has not come back. It's about 98% of pre-pandemic levels. The gap between supply and demand, I think conventional wisdom in the media thinks the, the gap is because OPEC or OPEC plus is not producing as much as they should be, but really half of the gap is from my home country, the United States, because US producers, for the same reason producers worldwide are not producing at higher levels is because of investment concerns, and uh, I'll get into that uh, a little later. Uh, but also total inventories grew in July, but we're still at 438 million barrels below the five-year average, which illustrates, I think, the problem and the tightness in the market. And of course, spare capacity and OECD commercial and strategic inventories have been extensively tapped. In the United States, for example, uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, is almost at bare minimums now, so there's not any more rescue supplies from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the United States. And that, uh, those, those recent uh, releases runs out in October. Uh, U.S. production also, I should point out, shows signs of plateauing. The number of frack crews has leveled out since late April, and the rig count has stalled since early July. On natural gas, I don't have to tell people in Europe uh, and also Asia, the situation is far more dire. We're facing a multi-year global crisis in gas markets. And Europe's gas crisis will linger for years. Next winter could be even more severe than this winter. And a lot of people like to blame this on the war in Ukraine, and certainly it's added a premium to oil and gas prices. But if you think about last winter, uh, especially I was at the COP meeting in, in, uh, in Scotland, we were de already dealing with an energy crisis. So we can't put all the blame on the war in Ukraine. This is really about uh, a lack of investment in, in supply. And this isn't just a story about Europe. The media likes to focus on it because a lot of the media is focused in, in Europe, but Europe is part of a global market. As more LNG flows to Europe, some developing countries are being priced out of the market. Developing countries all over the world are suffering from fuel shortages and unaffordable energy. One example is uh, Pakistan had a, a recent tender a couple months ago for LNG and couldn't find one single seller to, to provide LNG because all of the cargoes are going to Europe where they're paying top dollar for it. On the demand side, China is constrained by continuing lockdowns as a result of the COVID pandemic. But despite this, Chinese demand in July this year was still 135,000 barrels a day above pre-pandemic levels. So imagine what happens when the economy in China fully reopens. And lastly, this idea that the cure to high prices is high prices. I don't think that's true anymore. And certainly, uh, I mean, I, I, number one, I think because of the transition, we've made structural changes uh, to the supply side. But I think it's pointing out that over history, uh, yes, there are dips in, in, in demand uh, when you have a recession, 
but it's temp but it, if it doesn't always contract and if it does it's only temporary and lastly the wor the worst impacts of the russian crisis i think are still ahead especially for oil markets uh, the market faces a severe disruption uh, this winter as the EU bans will come into effect. The EU imported about 3 million barrels of Russian oil, crude, and products in August, and the EU crude ban comes to effect in December, and the product ban comes into effect in February of next year. China, India, and Turkey are now the primary buyers of Russian oil, about 2.5 million barrels a day in August versus 1.1 last year. And this winter, the markets will be scrambling to reroute and replace at least 2.5 million barrels of Russian flows. So rerouting Russia's petroleum product exports is more complicated uh, than for crude oil. Now let me talk a little bit about the future and sort of a, what we call the roadmap for rebuilding at the IEF. Number one, the most important thing we can do for energy security is investment and investment in upstream. You know, setting aside the Russia-Ukraine uh, situation, markets, as I pointed out earlier, were already in a supply deficit from the pandemic and from underinvestment. The IAF and uh, S&P Platts uh, last year did a, a report on the investment crisis in the upstream uh, sector, and we're, we're currently updating that report for this year. And essentially what it found was over, over the first uh, two years of the pandemic, CapEx cuts were, about, were cut about 25% per year compared to pre-COVID levels. Uh, and this year, it looks to be a similar cut from pre-pandemic levels, although probably not as severe as 25%. Now, there's many reasons for this. Obviously, there's this whole concept of capital discipline and investor returns, the the sector wasn't doing so well uh, compared to healthcare or tech sectors, but now it's doing better, so hopefully that uh, concern is resolved. There are, of course, uh, permitting issues, uh, but we also have this concept of ESG and, uh, uh, and sustainability investing, which, which puts a lot of pressure on, on the sector. And of course, the pandemic really exacerbated what was already a problem of a lack of investment in supply. And so what our report concluded was that investment needs to increase by at least $525 billion annually for the next 10 years just to meet demand. And, you know, some people would say that's a very conservative number. I've seen other uh, uh, estimates that that number should be close to a trillion dollars. <throat> the other thing the IEF does is uh, every February we do an annual outlook symposium with OPEC and, and with the IEA. And essentially, I call it the battle of the energy outlooks. Uh, uh, the OPEC and IA will give their short, medium, and long-term views of, of energy outlook and as we meet our goals for the transition. And essentially, the difference between the different outlook scenarios, not just of OPEC and, and IA, but we incorporate companies and IRENA and, and, and a lot of private sector outlooks, so there's probably like 40 different outlooks, but the difference between the highest and lowest demand for oil in 2050, based on all sorts of models and scenarios, is about uh, 100 uh, million barrels a day. And that's about the size of today's oil market. So if you're a company looking to make investment decisions as a policymaker, or, uh, or, or, or if, you're look, if you're a company looking to make an investment decision or a policymaker looking to make decisions on energy roadmaps, how do you make these decisions with such great uncertainty about where the market's going in 2050? You may ask yourself why, you may think it's strange that the president of a, or the secretary general of a, an international energy organization uh, is, is talking about investment in upstream. And I say it because I care about the energy transition and progress on climate. I'm very worried that if the public starts to equate high energy prices and volatility with the transition or climate policies, we're in big trouble. I know, at least in my country, in the United States, if, if the public starts to lose support for something that's so existential to their daily lives, it'll be very hard to get that support back. So we need to manage the transition, to power the economy, to address energy poverty, and keep continued progress on climate. 
Another component of the roadmap to rebuilding the second component is really technology. And that's why I'm excited to be here today to speak to, the, uh, to the, this youth forum. Uh, yes, we need more wind and solar, but according to the IEA technology report of uh, 2020, wind and solar only get us halfway to meeting our uh, uh, net zero goals by 2050. We need new technologies, technologies that are not even commercialized and not even envisioned in some cases, enable, to enable us to get the other half of our climate goals. So the reality is there's no current alternatives to hydrocarbons. And we need more clean energy R&D by governments and by companies. Um, and I think this is why it's so exciting that you have a very robust uh, youth forum uh, component of the WPC because we need more young people to work for energy companies. If we want to scale up these transitions that are going to be developed in technologies and uh, those that are in, in commercialization phases right now and those that aren't, aren't even invented, we need young people, brilliant minds to join these companies, and we need energy companies, the big energy companies of today, to help us scale up these solutions. And two of these solutions are CCUS, carbon capture use and storage. Uh, the other one is hydrogen. The IAF recently came out with a, a hydrogen report that looked at the early stages of how do we accelerate the early stages of hydrogen. Hydrogen needs to play a key role in decarbonizing hard to abate sectors. Uh, but we, we need to get away from the complicated and uh, really oversimplified color codes of hydrogen to develop new carbon intensity scales uh, and measure tracking and carbon intensity. And those will be key elements to international trade uh, for hydrogen. And lastly, the, the third component to rebuilding is really a renewed focus on energy access and energy poverty. This really has to be a priority uh, to the rebuilding after the pandemic and, and this recession. You know, far away from Europe and Ukraine, 600 million people in Africa suffer from energy poverty, and that number is growing. The World Bank uh, recently said a couple months ago that uh, the pandemic has actually made that worse. We were actually making progress, and that number was, was contracting, but now it's actually grown by about 90 million uh, people. And so the, the scale of the energy challenge in Africa is, is huge. The continent adds the population, a, a country of the size of France or Thailand, every two years. And the pandemic has, as I said, widened the gap between those with energy and those without. And the West often looks at this issue through their lenses of what they know about energy and energy efficiency in, in European and, and US and other Western countries, but often they don't really understand it. Let me just give you one example. Heathrow Airport in London consumes more energy than the entire country of Sierra Leone. You know, one African minister joked to me recently uh, at an energy conference in Nigeria that uh, we can decarbonize after we carbonize. And indeed, African countries are already net zero. They need energy for development, for life. At a lot of energy conferences that I attend, and I know everyone here attends these conferences, I hear a lot of this term, we, well, we have to be careful about the transition because of stranded assets. Well, I think we need to be worried about stranded lives, stranded lives in Africa right now. And uh, with widespread energy poverty in the world, we can never achieve sustainable growth and a just and fair energy uh, transition. So we're advocating for energy poverty and energy access at the IEF to have the same focus that the world gave to the pandemic, fighting the pandemic and achieving vaccines, and the same focus and emphasis we give uh, to climate uh, progress. And it really needs to be a priority on that level. So finally, at the IEF, we're, we're receiving a growing chorus of demands from our 71 member countries to really conceptualize a new approach to addressing carbon emissions that pays much more attention to energy security and market stability and this issue of energy access. And indeed, the G20 leaders last year in Rome called on the IEF to intensify a global dialogue on this very uh, topic. So as a result, we're in the process of launching a new initiative across a range of stakeholders, 
including energy producers and consumers, uh, industry, think tanks, and civil society, to explore new approaches to address carbon emissions that emphasizes energy security and market stability. I hope Kazakhstan will join us in this vitally important uh, global energy dialogue, and I'm working on trying to get uh, the minister uh, to join uh, the IEF, and, and uh, we've already had some positive discussions, and, and I, I look forward to those continuing. But I'd like to thank you once again for the opportunity to address this important conference and wish you the very best in your deliberations and program here. Thank you very much. Question, if I may? Mr. Kuhn. You are one of the most experienced, internationally experienced uh, person here in this um, hall. We have a number of uh, high representatives of uh, international companies here, Chevron, Shell, Total, and others. And some of them are uh, uh, now at the stage of uh, making a decision about the expansion of the further expansion of the project and uh, in this regard my question is uh, what is your vision in the in the long term for the for example for the next decade uh, the demand of oil uh, when the peak oil will be reached and what would be the price level thank you all easy questions. Yes. Uh, well, we actually think that, uh, as I said in my comments, uh, you know, renewables only get us about halfway to meeting our climate goals, and, and that's because we don't have technologies that are uh, commercialized uh, and those that are not even envisioned. So there are really no alternatives, current alternatives, to hydrocarbons. And so we're really going to need hydrocarbons well into the future, even under the IEA, uh, you know, net zero uh, approach, hydrocarbons still has, has a role. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it, uh, you know, I think if we focus on technologies like CCUS, you know, there are those people uh, who, you know, claim to care about climate change, but really they only care about keeping fossil fuels and hydrocarbons in the ground. I think the focus really needs to be on emissions. And that's why it's so important we make advances on CCUS. Not just CCUS, but also direct air capture, carbon renewal, removal. I'm, I'm very uh, uh, op, uh, optimistic about uh, all of these technologies. But um, I, I think, you know, so in any event, I, I do think there's, there's a, a very robust uh, future I think the problem with the different models that we've seen is that they've anticipated uh, declines in demand that are not panning out. And uh, I like to say we have to listen to markets, not models. And um, uh, so, but I would say this, the companies have a responsibility, but I think it's important for us to, as governments and as uh, an indus industrial sector to engage with investors because the investors are the other part of this problem. And um, I, I, I say this uh, to my own country in the United States, you know, they, they're doing a lot to pressure energy companies to produce more and to create uh, more refining, but they really need, and, and as an industry and as a, a organizations like mine, we need to engage with investors because Investors need to be more responsible. You know, the E, S, and G is not just E. There's an S and a G part of it as well. And S stands for social development. And uh, I think it's really important for investors that care about sustainability, as I said, to be worried about the public losing support for climate policies. And uh, uh, so that's why I think we have to be very careful. We have to support big projects like those in Kazakhstan that are going to provide energy security. And I think Kazakhstan is going to have a key role here in the, in, the, in the next decade. So what's your answer then? <laughs> you know, your answer can change the Kazakhstani oil industry in the next five years. If your answer, <laughs> if your answer will be positive. 
Well, if I were on the investing side, I would be very uh, bullish on, on Kazakhstan, the need for hydrocarbons. But the question is about the global demand. What do you think? You, you, you talked about China that is still uh, not uh, consuming at, at, full, uh, at full level. So, uh, and in the next decade, with this, uh, in, I mean, with this geopolitical situation in the world, with this uh, pandemic uh, uh, consequences, et cetera, et cetera. So what would be the oil demand in the next 10 years? And whether the peak oil is shifted or not. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I think this concept of peak oil, there's actually an opinion piece in Bloomberg today saying it's already arrived, which I, I strongly disagree with. Um, but, uh, you know, look, we, we, demand increases every year. We're not seeing, uh, and, and you have population growth, as I talked about in Africa, it, they double the population of country the size of France every two years. Southeast Asia is such a huge growth area for, for energy demand, and that's not going away. And, and their populations uh, right now, you know, the, the income levels are not a, at a, a level to really drive demand, even though it's quite robust. But, you know, the, these generations are going to want, you know, uh, you know automobiles and, and different uh, things in life that are going to spike uh, demand as well. So. Um, you know, I, I just I just don't see uh, you know demand. I don't see a peak demand on the horizon. That's yet to really be proven to me. In scenario, in models, yes, they can model it. The net zero model is basically that just took where we want to be in 2050 and worked backwards. It didn't really have a thoughtful analysis of what will happen to demand, um, and so. Uh, uh, you know, until, until we get and develop these technologies, and by the way, one of the technologies is CCUS, which is going to keep the industry as a vital component well into the future. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like just to compliment and thank Mr. Zurebekov for being so savvy and using this opportunity to pick on the brains of our world-class speakers today at the spot. And I was myself actually getting ready in my pen to take note of the magic number of the future oil price, and I was hoping to get this $1 million answer, or if not billion dollar answer, but uh, maybe hopefully later on, I'm pretty sure that this is something like this crystal ball of the future oil price is something very important to, to us all, not only government, but the oil, oil and gas industry professionals in the country, in the region, with regards to making the investment decisions, the final investment decisions with their projects, investing into exploration, production, and new assets. So, dear Mr. Joseph, Again, thank you very much for your wonderful remarks on current energy market dynamics and the outlook going forward. Uh, also, very special thanks for your joint data initiative and making this available to the whole world. Actually, this, this is very, very important. And I particularly liked how you talked to us with regards to very complex dilemmas, which is energy transition, energy security, energy access, and energy poverty. So all of these aspects are very, very important, and they are intertwined among themselves. Thank you very much for a very, very wonderful remarks on that. So dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, please allow me to invite our next speaker, Mrs. Lisana Kurbanshoeva the chair of the World Petroleum Council's Young Professionals Committee. So she's an oil and gas professional herself and member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers since 2013 and now chair of YPC Youth Committee. And I also wanted to thank uh, Lizana for an absolutely wonderful moderation this morning for the breakfast briefing with CEO session that we had earlier today with Mr. Kevin Lyon, 
the CEO of Tingis Chevroil, and Mr. Sanjar Jarkeshev, the CEO of Casa Gas. That was an absolutely brilliant moderation work, and I thank you for this as well. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marat. I will try to be very short, and I will not even try to predict the oil prices. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, dear participants of the 7th WPCU Forum. It's my honor to speak on the opening session on behalf of the WPC and Professionals Committee. First of all, I would like to thank Kazakhstan National Committee for taking a lead and organizing this event. You did a great job, and we all are very much looking forward to these uh, two days here. WPC Youth Forum is a unique platform that allows us to bring hundreds of participants from all over the world and to initiate the discussion around our industry to help us to grow our network and also to make sure that the voice of young generation is heard by industry leaders and decision makers. I strongly believe that initiating and maintaining such dialogue is a key to solving energy industry challenges, even more in such a turbulent times that we are living now with numerous instabilities. When I look back to June 2019, when we had the sixth WPCU forum in St. Petersburg, I get a feeling that it was in the other life. Since then, in addition to all industry rapid transformations, we lived through global COVID pandemic, which undoubtedly changed and transformed our societies and also our ways of life. Now, we are all experiencing shocking geopolitical crisis in Ukraine, but also in some other parts of the world. With all these instabilities, it seems that more than ever, the questions of energy access, affordability, and security are at the top of the global energy agenda. And in addition to above mentioned points, our society is still facing and fighting a major global and collective challenge, a climate change. More frequent and severe floods, droughts, and fires are becoming a reality, a daily reality, for many people around the world. And if we want to keep the, our target of 1.5 degrees within the reach, we must turn all the promises into actions urgently and reduce our CO2 emissions. And we already see, of course, some actions taken in these directions. Companies are diversifying their portfolios, investing more in renewable energy sources. First, CCUS projects are being developed. Regulations are shifting, and so, society, and so are society behaviors. Many countries are implementing the net zero strategies, including the Kazakhstan, who aim to neutral, um, carbon neutrality by 2060. The topic of the next WPC Congress, which will be held in Calgary, is also to, dedicated to this topic and will be energy transition, the path to net zero. So, as I said, there are actions, but there is still a lot more that we need to do. Facing all these challenges, many young professionals and students start questioning their future in the industry. What skills will be required? Which technologies will dominate? Will the things that I learn now still be relevant when I graduate or when I start my career? How will companies and their policies change? And what will be my role in these energy transformations? I'm convinced that you will be able to discuss and hopefully find some answers to these questions during these two days of the forum. WPC Young Professionals Committee and Kazakhstan National Committee did a great job and put to build up up-to-date technical program inviting top, top experts of industry and covering three main blocks, innovative leadership, sustainable technologies, energy and society. I would like once again to thank Kazakhstan National Committee for providing us with such a platform. But I would also like to thank the whole International WPC Young Professional Committee for your contribution to this success. And to addition to that, to all the members of our committee who on a daily basis, in addition to their full-time job, uh, leading and managing our projects, such as mentoring program, survey, magazine, and YP Connect. 
It's always inspiring and motivating to see the team of young professionals and students volunteering to shape the global energy future by bringing together the passion and talents of industry young professionals, students, and emerging leaders. In everything we do within the YPC committee, we are aligned with our priorities. It's connecting future leaders together and to current industry leaders, sharing passion for the industry and the WPC brand locally, bridging geopolitical boundaries to foster new relationships, integration of global young professionals' perspective to the industry, and fostering leadership skills today to serve the future of the industry. So thank you again, the whole Young Professional Committee of the World Petroleum Council. With that being said, I invite everyone to join our dialogue of generations, share your ideas, stand up for your convictions, network and build relations that will last a long time. And I believe that the truth is born in debate. So I wish everyone a fruitful and enjoyable discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lazano. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful address directed specifically towards our youth, the young professionals, and answering some of the very key questions they are facing today. What skills will be required? What technologies will game change our oil and gas industry going forward? And what would be my role in this? So I, I'm pretty sure that uh, your presentation and your messages will be very, very useful to our young professionals. So now, dear ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to close our forum today with a very wise thought of two philosophers, I would say. The first one is a very well-known philosopher, Mr. Al-Farabi, who once said that choosing the right path starts with choosing the right step. So it is very important to us that we make the right steps towards, towards bright energy future that would also include and encompasses all the relevant messages that our speakers today have mentioned. The second uh, is not a philosopher, but uh, I believe is a very, very wise man, Uncle Ben of Spider-Man, who once said, with great powers comes great responsibility. So I believe that with you, our future oil and gas professionals and oil and gas leaders and energy leaders, it is up to you and it is your responsibility to do more, become more, and work more and study more in order to secure bright energy future for not only us here in Kazakhstan, but globally. So with that, again, please allow me to thank our wonderful and world-class panel speakers today, and thank you very much all for participating. Thank you.